Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Indy from UCLA. So I'm going to talk about our study on the uh, name server selection of DNS caching resolvers. Um, this is a collaboration uh, of UCLA and the Verizon Labs. So according to the DNS specification, um, a DNS domain should be supported by at least two authoritative name servers. So when a caching resolver needs to query a DNS domain, it may want to select one of those uh, authoritative name servers to send the queries. And some caching resolvers may prefer to select the fastest name server to query so that they can minimize the latency of the whole DNS lookup. While some others, uh, they may prefer to distribute queries among all those name servers um, so that they can avoid overloading the fastest name server and they can make their server selection behavior unpredictable to prevent some malicious attack. And even for those caching resolvers that prefer the fastest name server, they still need to query those unselected name server from time to time so that, so that they can tell which one is the fastest. And in this work, we're trying to answer three questions. The first one is, do all those caching resolvers um, select the fastest name server? And if we find some cache resolvers that do, that do not select the fastest name server, um, instead they choose some slower one, we want to understand uh, if that's a mistake or they just intend to do that. And the third question is that um, the network is not always stable. Um, some um, name server may become unresponsive uh, occasionally. So we want to know if the cache resolvers can detect um, the unresponsive name server and even can detect the recovery of those unresponsive name server. So we have tested five different implementations of cache resolvers, including Band, um, PowerDNS, Mbound, DNS Cache, and Windows DNS. And for Band, we have tested uh, two versions, uh, Band 9.7 and Band 9.8. So here is an illustration of our test uh, bed. Um, so our measurement is a trace-driven measurement. Uh, we collect a DNS lookup trace from a ISP's resolver's log. Um, we use a trace replayer to reproduce the DNS lookups and send them to uh, the tested caching resolvers. And all these tested caching resolvers use uh, their default settings. Uh, since the name server selection is only meaningful when we are talking about one domain, um, so we choose the .com domain uh, in our test bed as the target domain. Um, we set up 13 name servers um, for the .com domain, and we put a network emulator in front of these name servers so that we can create uh, different uh, packet delay and packet loss. And to redirect the DNS queries to the .com servers, uh, we also set up a root server. And since most DNS lookup cannot get the direct answers from the .com server, we also set up a name server for the second level domain. So that, and we use the wildcard so that uh, all those DNS lookup can be terminated at this server. And the query trace we used um, lasts for 10 minutes. Uh, it contains about 3.5 million uh, DNS lookups, uh, involves 400,000 unique DNS names um, belonging to 150,000 second level domains under the .com domain. And the average um, iterative query rate between the caching resolver and the .com domain is about 250 queries per second. Um, but this query rate could be higher if the uh, caching resolver doesn't have a large cache and the domains set the TTL of the DNS records to be a small value. Um, we created several um, scenarios to test different property of the cache resolvers. Here we list three of them for discussion. Uh, in the first scenario, um, we want to see if the cache resolvers can tell the difference um, in the round trip time of different name servers. Uh, so that they can um, distribute queries according to that. So as you can see, um, the round trip time uh, to each name server 
uh, varies from 50 milliseconds to 170 milliseconds. And in the second scenario, we want to see if the uh, caching resolver can detect the unresponsive name server and then avoid sending queries to that one. So in this scenario, the first name server is unresponsive. Well, um, in the third scenario, um, we want to see if the cache resolver can detect the recovery of those unresponsive name servers. So in this scenario, the first name server is unresponsive at the beginning, but it comes back after five minutes. Um, so next I will um, briefly talk about how those name uh, cache resolvers select the name server. So um, most cache resolvers will use the smooth round trip time to estimate the delay to different um, name servers um, based on previous queries round trip time. And some cache resolvers uh, use a strategy that is to select the name server with the least estimated round trip time. Um, for, those, for those unselected name servers, uh, these cache resolvers will, will decrease their estimated round trip time um, so that at some time they become the least one and this, this name server can be queried again. And in those tested cache resolvers, um, Band 9, uh, 8, and PowerDNS use such a strategy. And some other cache resolvers uh, use another strategy, that is to select the name server uh, based on some probability that is related to the estimated round trip time. And in this case, even some um, name servers with a large round trip time can still be selected, but with a very small probability. And in our tested uh, caching resolvers, Ben97 and Mbound adopts this strategy. So now let's look at uh, our measurement result. And we did find uh, some caching resolvers that prefer the fastest name server. Uh, so here is a measurement result in the first scenario. Um, as you can see, uh, the graph on the right, uh, we list the name server along the x-axis according to their round trip time. So the first name server has the least uh, round trip time and the last one has the longest round trip time. And the, the y-axis is the queries uh, that sent to each name servers. And as you can see, the PowerDNS distributes almost queries to the fastest name server. But actually, um, PowerDNS also queries the other um, but since the uh, number is very small, so you cannot see it here. And another caching resolver, Band97, also sends a lot of queries to the fastest name server, um, but it also distributes a lot of queries to the others. Uh, this is because um, Band97 distributes um, the queries statistically. That is, for those cache and resolve, uh, for those name servers with the round trip time less than 128 milliseconds, um, and band 97 will select those with the smaller round trip time with the higher probability. And even for those name servers with the round trip time larger than 128 milliseconds, uh, since, the M, since the band 97 also used the SRCT decaying, this name server can still be selected, but after some time. And we also found some caching resolvers that do not prefer the fastest name server, um, like the Ambon DNS cache and the Windows DNS. But the reasons for this are different. Um, for the DNS cache, since it doesn't measure the round trip time of queries, so it has no idea which one is better or not. Um, what it can do is just uniformly distribute queries to all those name servers. And for the Mbound, Mbound does measure the round trip time of each name server, but it used that uh, as the upper bound for its name server selection. Um, so for Mbound, uh, it only selects those name servers with the round trip time less than 400 milliseconds and distribute queries uniformly to this name server. And for the Windows DNS, um, as we don't have its source code, so we don't know the detailed reason for that. And the most weird result we found is the query distribution of Band 98. As you can see, um, Band 98 sends most queries to the slowest name server. However, when we look into the implementation of Band 98, 
we found that Benite actually adopts the most traditional server selection algorithm. That is, to select the name server with the least estimated round trip time and use the SRTT decaying to um, query those unresponsive, uh, unselected name server um, periodically. However, our measurement results suggest that this algorithm does not take effects, so we try to understand why. So here, um, let's look at how band 9A selects the name server. Um, the graph on right uh, shows how the round trip time, estimated round trip time of a name server varies in the band 9A. Um, actually, it varies periodically, and a period consists of three phases. So in the first phase, um, the estimated round trip time keep decaying, uh, keep decreasing until it becomes the least one. So after that, this name server will be selected. Um, from that time, uh, the, the server enter into another phase, that is the selected phase. And in this phase, this name server will be keeping being selected. Um, and two, its estimated round trip time has been updated by the coming responses from that server so that its estimated round trip time is no longer the least one. And after that, um, it will enter into the third phase that is the update phase. So in this phase, the estimated round trip time will keep, being, uh, will keep being updated by following responses so that um, until there is no out outstanding queries to that name server. Um, so we can notice that uh, in these three phases, only in the uh, select phase, the server can be selected. So actually, the number of queries sent to this uh, name server can be proportional to the ratio of the length of the selected phase and the length of the whole period. And to note that the length of the selected phase and, and the length of the update phase uh, is about one round trip time. So actually, it is the length of the decaying phase that can determine how many queries will be sent to the slower server. Um, however, in the um, band 98, the decaying speed is coupled with the um, query rate. So that means if the query rate is higher, then the SRTT will decay faster. So we will get a shorter uh, decaying phase, and more queries will be sent to the slower server. And to verify our speculation, uh, we redo our measurement under a lower query rate. So in this case, uh, we reduce the query rate from 250 queries per second to 25 queries per second. So now we got lower query rate, and the, SRT, uh, the estimated round trip time decays slower, and we got a longer decaying phase, so a fewer query will be sent to the slower server. So as the result on right shows, uh, most of queries will be sent to the fastest named server. So now we need to consider the factors that cause the high iterative query rate um, between the cache resolver and the DNS domain. So at the cache resolver side, uh, if the resolver does not have a large cache or the resolver serves a lot of user, then it probably generates a lot of queries in a short time. And at the domain side, uh, if the TTL of the DNS record is very short, or the domain is very popular, like the .com has a lot of uh, DNS records to be queried, then this uh, domain may trigger a lot of queries. And the problem we have discussed will become more serious um, if there exists some unresponsive name server. So here we show the measurement result in the second scenario. Uh, so in this scenario, the first name server become unresponsive. Um, but we can see that um, Ben still sends a lot of queries to the unresponsive name server. And the reason for this result is that um, it's because how Ben treats those unresponsive name server. And for those cache resolvers uh, that use the SRTT decaying, they treat the unresponsive name server as a regular name server, but with a very, very large estimated round trip time. So they expect that this name server will wait a long time to decay to be the least one so that they can be queried again. However, this assumption is not true 
when the query rate is high and the decay speed is faster. Um, so in some, uh, when the decay speed is very faster, uh, sometimes the unresponsive name server may need to wait only a few milliseconds to be selected again. And the worst thing is that once this name server, uh, this unresponsive name server has been selected, it will keep being selected until the query's timeout timer get expired. And usually the value of the query's timeout timer is three or four seconds. So that means a res uh, unresponsive name server only needs to wait a few milliseconds to be selected. But once it has been selected, it will keep being selected for several seconds. So that's why we can see Band 98 send a lot of queries to the unresponsive name server. So now let's look at how the other cache resolvers uh, handle those unresponsive name server. Uh, so the first one is PowerDNS. Um, as we can see, the PowerDNS shift all those queries from the first uh, name server to the second. Um, so in this case, this case uh, result is because uh, PowerDNS use a very, very slow decaying speed. So the unresponsive name server needs to wait about three minutes to be selected again. And for the inbound, um, inbound can detect uh, the unresponsive name server. And once a name server is detected as unresponsive, inbound use only a few queries to prop that name server until it get, comes back. And for the DNS cache, uh, since DNS cache does not measure the round trip time of the queries, so it cannot detect the unresponsive name server. And for the Windows DNS, uh, it can detect the uh, unresponsive name server and can avoid sending queries to it. Now for those um, name, uh, cache resolvers that can detect uh, the unresponsive name server, we want to see how long um, do they take to detect the recovery of those uh, unresponsive name server. And for Ambon, uh, it may take up to 15 minutes to detect that. Um, actually, the 15 minutes is the interval between two consecutive probes that will be sent to the unresponsive name server. And for PowerDNS, um, the time is about three minutes, and this is the result of its slow decaying speed. And for band, um, actually the time depends on the query rate. So as you have seen before, uh, if the query rate is high, uh, a lot of queries will be sent to the unresponsive name server. So it's very easy for band to detect uh, the server recovery. However, if the query rate is low, um, then the band may need to uh, may need a long time to select the unresponsive name server. Um, so band may wait a long time to detect the, the recovery. And for Windows DNS, uh, it may take about one second to discover um, the recovery. Now here is the conclusion. Um, it's, it's wrong. Okay, uh, so based on our um, measurement result, um, we found that uh, if we want to implement a caching resolver, um, a comprehensive test is needed because some similarly sound algorithm may not work as expected. Um, however, uh, for, for example, um, the SRTT decaying uh, cannot work as we expected. Uh, the purpose of SRTT decay is to help the cache resolver to query those unselected name server um, periodically. However, the result is that the SRTT decay forced the um, cache resolver to query a uh, suboptimal name server for a while. And another thing that um, we cannot treat the unresponsive name server as the responsive name server, but with a large estimated round trip time. Because once the unresponsive name server is selected, it will keep being selected until the timeout timer get expelled. And um, also, since we have noticed that the impact of those unresponsive name server uh, is, sig is, sig is significant, so once you have discovered some unresponsive name server, you should repel it as soon as possible, even though the other 
uh, NIMS server works very well because the unresponsive NIMS server will still attract a lot of queries uh, from those uh, regular NIMS servers. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. <sighs> Sorry, the, um, the slides is a little different from the one I submitted, so <laughs> there may be some incons inconsistency. Do we have questions? Hi, Eric Zegast, ISC. Um, I, I perceive that there was some sort of surprise or puzzlement that the RTT so, or the server selection changed between 9.7 and 9.8. Is it still unknown as to why, is it still unknown to you as to why that, that changed or that there was a change? Uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't get your question. The, the question is, 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 it, is it a puzzle to you that there was a change between 9.7 and 9.8 for how the RTT handling worked? Uh, no, that's not the change between 9.7 and 9.8. It's actually the, the, the algorithm that 9.8 used. Uh, it, so you cannot uh, treat the unresponsive name server uh, as responsive one. And also, you cannot um, select a name server, um, or you cannot uh, couple the query rate with the decaying speed. Yeah. Well, I, I just, while I was look, watching your presentation, I just looked at the release notes, and if, you're still have, if there are still questions, it's actually in the release notes as to the, the algorithm changed, and here's why. So. Uh, I think that's not the uh, change between that because um, the change between band 9.7 and band 9.8 is uh, that band 9.8 removes the bond uh, that band 9.7 used to have. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't help to solve this problem because you, ha you have seen uh, if there are some unresponsive name server, both band 9.7 and band 9.8 will send a lot of queries to the unresponsive name server. And that's because um, the way band treat those unresponsive name server is not very good. Uh, we should separate um, the processing unresponsive name server and the responsive name server in different way. Yeah, could I? I'm Matt Larson from uh, from Verisign and, and uh, was working with Inky on this. I mean, Eric, we we are aware that the algorithm changed from 9.7 to 9.8, and we understand that the release notes say that. But the point of Yingdi's research and what he discovered is that. Perhaps there's this unaffected side effect of the uh, unexpected side effect of the new algorithm. That's all we're pointing out. All right. Well, we'll look into it. I'm sure. Sorry, I thought he was going to ask a question. Um, Michael Sinatra, um, Energy Sciences Network. Just a quick comment. I actually really appreciate that this is the version of slides that went in here because I really like that last slide on um, implications for operators. I think it's really useful for us to understand what happens when our authoritative name servers goes down. So, um, you know, just wanted to throw that in there. I think that's pretty important to look at. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andy. That was very interesting. <laughs> And it is now time for our break. And please use some time in the break to fill out the survey, 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 survey. Um, and enjoy your coffee from Infoblox.